Okay. Well, so we talked about last time about what is life. And one of the key aspects of life is that it has evolutionary adaptation. So it evolves and changes very slowly over time. So for this lesson, we're going to look at what is natural selection, what is evolution, and what's the difference between the two. So you may find that what you thought, you talked about the theory of evolution. Well, there is no theory of evolution, and I'll talk about why that's true. Evolution is data. Evolution is something we observe. What's really a theory is natural selection. And so we're going to look at what natural selection says and why it is so important to biology. In fact, all of modern biology and modern medicine is based on this idea of evolution. So let's get started. So as I said, when you hear people talk about the theory of evolution, that means they really don't understand what it is they're talking about. There is no theory of evolution. Evolution isn't a theory, it's an observation. It's something that we see in the environment. And you can actually do this for yourself. If you've ever done an experiment where you've got fruit flies, fruit flies will either have blue eyes or green eyes. You can take a population of almost all blue-eyed fruit flies and you can selectively breed them so that pretty soon, only the, the entire population, pretty much the entire population, has green eyes. If you have a few left that have blue, you can selectively breed those until nothing is left but blue eyes. You can go back and forth and back and forth. That's evolution. It takes, you know, several generations of fruit flies to do that, to get the whole population going that way. So this is, it's an observation. It's data. So it's something that we see. But one thing that's important that a lot of people get confused about is it's the slow change in a species over time. An organism never, ever evolves into something else. Once you're born, you're stuck. This is what you've got. Now, your children may be slightly different from you. And in fact, they almost certainly will be slightly different from you. And it's not and even more different than, you know, the different characteristics of the two parents. There are some random things coming in. Your DNA is being randomly changed all the time. We're getting affected by cosmic rays that will come in and zap a little bit in your in your DNA and it'll change the code just a little bit. Most of these things are harmless. Most of them don't make any difference at all, but sometimes they actually give you traits that make you a little bit better or maybe a little bit worse because evolution is not conscious. It's not something that is intentionally trying to make you better. A lot of people seem to think that evolution drives you to be better and that is simply not true. It is simply random changes over time, but it's changes in the species. Back when the Scopes trial, if you remember that, I remember reading about that, there was a debate about whether evolution could be taught in the schools. And they said, well, I've never seen a monkey turning into a man. Well, no, you wouldn't, because individual organisms don't evolve into other organisms. Humans and monkeys, humans and apes really, came from the, a common ancestor. But monkeys don't turn into humans and humans don't turn into monkeys. It just doesn't work that way. So individual organisms don't evolve into anything. You just are what you are. So we're talking about the change in species over time. And if you happen to be born with a trait that helps you be more likely to live to have babies, that trait is more likely to be passed on. If you're born with a trait that is less likely for you to live to have babies, then that trait is not going to be passed on, and eventually it's going to die out in the population. So humans actually cause evolution in a lot of organisms. What you may not realize is broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, Brussels sprouts, kale, and, and calabri all, all came from the same plant. They came from the wild mustard plant, and it didn't happen naturally. They found a wild mustard plant, for example, that had some very large flower clusters, and they bred those together so that it got even larger flower cluster, clusters. And then over several generations, eventually, you've got something that's almost nothing but flower clusters, and that's cauliflower. Same thing happens with the leaves becoming kale and things like that. And so they eventually do become different species, but all of this was done by humans. It's still evolution. It evolved, the wild mustard plant evolved into these other six species, but that evolution was driven by humans. It was not what we would call natural selection. Beagles are another example. You ever notice that the beagle has this white tip and when it's hunting, its tail always stands straight up. Well, beagles were bred to to hunt foxes in tall grass. And so whenever it sees a fox, that tail comes up and you can see that white tip above the grass as the beagle goes right on. And so they just found a dog, a couple of dogs that were close to what they were looking for and they bred them and they had puppies and they chose the puppies that had traits they were looking for. And they bred those until eventually you got this breed of beagles that we have today. Again, this is humans causing evolution. It's normal and it happens. 
you hear people talking about, you know, genetically modified organisms. Well, we've been genetically modifying organisms for about 3,000 years now. So this is not really a new thing when it comes down to it. We just do it the old fashioned way. We make them have sex and have babies from that. The new way of genetically modifying it, you can change the DNA directly, not look for the DNA that you need and, and encourage that to breed. So natural selection, on the other hand, is a theory. And so this is the theory that Darwin, Charles Darwin put forth. And this is something reasonably intelligent people can debate. You know, evolution is a fact. You can't debate that. You see it. It's there. What causes evolution, that's something you can definitely debate. And that's the theory. So natural selection is, was developed by Charles Darwin as he sailed as a naturalist on board the HMS Beagle. See what I did there. So this was a ship that was sailing mostly around the Galapagos Islands. And each of these islands had an isolated ecosystem. And he found a wide diversity of creatures, and he was mostly looking at finches, but there were other things he was looking at, that had specialized for their environment. And it occurred to him that there were two basic principles. Those islands were small, so there were insufficient resources for every possible kind of animal to live there, every possible kind of bird. However, so that means that they're going to have unequal reproductive success. That means some of them are going to live to have babies and some of them aren't. And so these two principles, they're not really something you can debate. It's true, right? There's limited resources, and so there's going to be unequal reproductive success. So when these resources are scarce, the organisms that have traits that make best use of those resources, they're the ones that are most likely going to survive to have babies. Though that trait then, because they had sex and passed down their traits, are going to go on to their babies. So they're going to, they're going to, that new baby is going to have that trait. Now, eventually, you might get some other random mutations, some of which help and some of which don't in a particular environment. Those that don't are going to tend to die out. Here in our modern world, humans have a lot of different traits. I mean, there's a reason we don't look like clones of each other. But most of our traits don't matter. They're not going to be something that's going to keep you from surviving in the world. And so, therefore, you're completely able to pass those traits down to your offspring, and the diversity in humans will survive. There's nothing that's making things get weeded out or things that are being reinforced and making you more likely to have a baby from that. So this is a picture of the Galapagos Island. In the lab, you're going to be working with the Galapagos. You're going to do a quick tour of the Galapagos Islands, and we'll talk about that in just a little bit. So let me give you a, a hypothetical situation. You can follow along with what's in your, in your class notes here. But let's suppose the north side of this island has trees with very hard seeds. And it also has bugs that live in the tree bark. So the seeds require a really strong beak for the birds to get in there. The bugs live in the tree bark, and so you've got to be able to get in there and pick them out. So let's say originally there is just one type of bird on the north side of the island. We'll call it first bird. So with this beak, it can crack the smaller seeds, but it can't get the tougher ones. And it can eat the bugs that are on the surface of the trees. So it does okay, you know, between getting the good protein that's in the bugs. Those bugs are really good for giving you the nutrients that you need. And it can work, and it can get at the seeds, and, and it can survive. So it's got two sources of food, and it's doing basically okay. Well, then along comes a random mutation. And this little guy actually has a narrower beak than this guy. Now, he can't eat the seeds. His beak isn't strong enough to, to get to the seeds. However, he can dig into the upper bark and get the, the big juicy bugs that are in there. And so these are very nutritious for him, right? So the question then is, who's going to get more food? Those seeds are really hard to work at. However, you can get some, right? However, those big, nutritious bugs, the digger bird is going to have a much easier time of it. So who's going to get a total of more nutrients? Who's going to get more food? So pause the video and think about it before you move on. Okay, did you circle your answer in your book? Because I think that's going to help you a whole lot. Actually, digger bird is going to get the most nutrition because he can get in those bugs that the first bird really can't do. First bird can only get, you know, the occasional ones that are on the surface, and he's having to work to get his food by getting those seeds. Digger bird is just happily getting all those yummy bugs just right out of the out of the bark from that. So which one is more likely to have babies, first bird or digger bird? Well, digger bird's got a better chance of getting food, so he's more likely to be able to survive to have babies. So digger bird's population is going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. First bird, he's surviving. 
His population is not really going down, but it's not going up as fast as the Diggerberg is. If the Diggerberg were to start taking away his resources, then his population would go down. But because he's only eating the surface ones, yeah, he's going to lose out a little bit to the Diggerberg. So his population might go down a little bit, but he's still got the seeds, and Diggerberg can't use those. So which will become a bigger percentage of the population? First bird, who is down to pretty much just using the seeds, or digger bird, who is quickly and easily getting all those ju juicy, delicious bugs. Right, so before too long, whereas we started out with just an entire population of first birds, eventually the number of first birds gets a little bit smaller, whereas the number of digger birds goes from just a few animals to a huge number of birds because they're able to reproduce so readily. They're able to take the best advantage of their environment. All right, so now let's suppose Dicker Bird has a baby that one of the many populations, one of the many examples of Dicker Birds out there has a mutation with Needle Bird. Okay, now Needle Bird cannot eat any seeds at all, but he can dig very, very deeply into the bark. So he's, whereas Dicker Bird might occasionally break open a soft seed, Needle bird's not going to get any at all. You see that his beak is just not made for, for breaking open any of those seeds. However, he can dig deeply into the bark and can easily get lots of those nutritious bugs. So who's going to get more food then? Is it going to be first bird, digger bird, or needle bird? Pause the video and think about it. Well, there's still seeds out there. So first bird isn't dying, but now he's not going to get any bugs at all, right? We've got two bug-eating species here. Needle bird, on the other hand, can get not only the surface birds and the ones in, but he can get those ones deeply within easily. So he's able to just go and pull out those bugs. And so he's getting lots and lots of food. So who's going to be the most likely one to have babies? We probably figured out by now that's going to be needle bird because he gets more food. He's got more resources available. It's not to say that these guys are going to die out, but their populations will probably drop a little bit. And so which becomes the largest percentage of the population? Well, that's going to be needle bird, right? So because he's able to get all the resources, he's going to have more babies. And just because he's more prolific, he's going to start having more and more, be a larger part of the population from that. All right. So now we've got lots of birds, three different species. Mostly they're going to be the needle bird. There's going to be a whole lot of, of, deck, of digger birds, but then a lot fewer first birds than there used to be. So due to crowding, there are a lot of fewer resources. So a large flock of all three species is going to move down to the south side of the island. Now, on the south side of the island, there are trees with the really hard seeds, but there are very few bugs in the trees at all. Almost no bugs at all. So who now is going to get the most food? First bird, digger bird, or needle bird? Well, that's going to be first bird. Remember, he was the one who was least adapted to the situation on the north side of the island. So he was getting the least amount of resources but he's still got his adaptation that he can eat those seeds. The amount of bugs now is virtually non-existent. These guys are in trouble. And so their population is going to get much, much smaller. Needle bird hardly gets any bugs at all. And so he's going to start to die out over time. So the needle bird population then is going to strongly decrease because he can't get to the bugs because there aren't any bugs there to get. First bird is like, oh, okay, yeah, I'm having to work for it, but I'm fine. And there's nobody competing with me. So I can pretty much get all the food that I need. So what's going to happen to first bird? Their population is going to increase then. Okay, now suppose that plague of lack of bugs spreads to the northern part of the island where I had mostly digger birds here. What's going to happen to the population where I had mostly needle birds and digger birds? What's going to happen to the population of the needle bird if we the problem of lack of bugs spreads to the north side of the island? So this used to be the most dominant species on the north side of the island. Well, it's going to dramatically decrease, isn't it? So they started out being really good, having a really well adapted situation. And now the environment has changed and they're no longer adapted for it. And now their population has started to fall off. They started to decrease their population and started to die out. So a trait is neither good nor bad ever. There is no such thing as a good trait or a bad trait. It's just a trait that helps you in your environment or one that doesn't help you in your environment or maybe even actively harms you in your environment. So if the 
the trait, if you don't have any traits that will allow you to succeed, First Bird, for example, was a generalist. It could do both. And so it had traits that it could stick around. But eventually, you know, if Needlebird can't get any, any bugs at all, it's going to die out. And so it can make the environmental changes, make the population go to zero. If that happens globally, then we say that the species is extinct. It will never come back from that. And that happens all the time. So species that are highly adapted to their environment, like the needle bird, are very fragile. It's easy to make them go extinct. Species that are generalists that are able to adapt to pretty much any environment, it's very difficult to make them go to become extinct. Humans are adapted to a huge range of environments. We can actually survive almost anywhere, and we do. And so this is why it is very difficult for anything to wipe us out. This is why we have become the dominant species on the planet. Some of it is our intelligence only because our intelligence helps us adapt to this range of environments. So it's not the fact that we're smarter that made us take over the planet necessarily. It's that our intelligence allowed us to be adaptable and to adapt to the different types of environments. I mean, let's face it, a lion is going to mess you up. You will never be able to outcompete a lion, but that lion has to stay in one specific type of environment, whereas you can live pretty much anywhere. So again, we aren't bigger or stronger, we're adaptable. So we rose to dominance because we had traits that made us adaptable. We think that any alien species that becomes intelligent, becomes technologically capable, will do the same thing. It's going to have traits that allow it to make best use of its environment. And this is how you're going to determine what your alien species looks like, what your intelligent aliens look like, because you're going to know what the environment on the planet is. And because natural selection seems to be the basis of all biology, you can say that the aliens that are dominant on that planet are going to be the ones that make the best use of that environment. And that allows you to determine what their characteristics are going to be. Okay, so Darwin realized that all life can be explained by natural selection. So even starting out with just, you know, individual single cell organisms, you get over millions and billions of years, you get these random mutations, some of which help, some of which don't in that particular case. So most of them, though, make no difference whatsoever. And that's the thing you've got to get keep in mind that ran, the mutations are just that, they're random. And so you get lots of mutations and you throw the dice and some of them come out good and some of them don't help. You know, over time, the ones, though, that come out good, and this was what Darwin realized, are going to make it, its population expand. They're going to start to become a larger percentage of the population. So things like eye color is an example of evolution. You know, you may have blue eyes or green eyes or brown eyes or black eyes or whatever, but this is not due to natural selection. You did not evolve brown eyes because that helped you compete better or help you survive better. It's simply a random trait. It just doesn't make any difference. So all of modern biology and medicine are based on natural selection. So even though natural selection is a theory, if it's wrong, then everything we know about medicine and biology is also wrong. And based on everything that we're doing, we're pretty sure that what we're doing works pretty good. So evolution, again, is an observation. It's a fact. Natural selection is a theory, but it's a darn good theory, and it's one that works really, really well. It's also very simple. Okay, so we're going to have you carry this a little bit further with the practice problems. We're going to give introduce a new species called Strongbird. And when that species arrives, you're going to determine what's going to happen to the population of the birds that are on our north side and south side of the island. Okay, so now you have a better idea of what's going on with natural selection and how it can enable us to determine the characteristics of the species. Because once you've found your habitable world in the final project, once you've locked that in and you've decided that, that yes, by God, this is my habitable world, then you're going to have the characteristics of that particular planet. The next part of the final, it's going to take you to a one-page sheet in Smart Sparrow where you're going to describe all of the different characteristics, physical characteristics, intellectual characteristics, societal characteristics, everything can be determined by natural selection. And we'll give you a little more example of that when we get towards the end of the class. We'll see you then.